The massive mobilization of civil society organizations across the Western Cape in the first six weeks of the COVID-19 lockdown, while the government scrambled to put in place financial alternatives for food relief, averted a catastrophic hunger crisis. The statistics tell the story in that the first month and a half, the South African Social Security Agency reported that the number of people nationally no longer being paid anything at all spiraled from 5.2% to 15.4% and worse is expected. It's being said here that the intervention by civil society organizations effectively helped avoid a hunger catastrophe. How big was the need and is it increasing? So uh, we have Florian Kroll on the line, the researcher and project manager at the Institute for Poverty and Land Agrarian Studies. Florian, what can you tell us about the situation? You're saying here that a catastrophic uh, hunger was avoided. Yeah, well, the situation is actually quite bad even now. And I think we need to bear in mind that the country was already in a situation of severe food insecurity even before lockdown. And um, with the lockdown regulations, many people were unable to work, unable to access income. And um, also many of the informal traders and spaza shops that were usually a, an important source of food for people in poorer areas were closed down. So people had difficulty accessing food. And um, mm. the situation is different in different places, but it is severe. Uh, a recent uh, study carried out by um, the UJ and HSRC uh, COVID democracy survey um, shows that the, the levels of hunger, I'd say, doubled or possibly even tripled yeah. uh, as opposed to pre-COVID times. Um, so it is a severe situation and it is affecting particularly um, children and learners and vulnerable people more than, more than others. But in the Western Cape, civil society was on the move. What exactly has the contribution been here? Well, civil society in the Western Cape has mobilized around this issue quite strongly. And um, that's been different kinds of initiatives. So there have been the big aid uh, NGOs that have mobilized uh, much support, um, distributing food. Um, but also there's been a really um, encouraging mobilization of community-based organizations um, and locally neighborhood-based organizations that are stepping into the gap and are providing aid through soup kitchens and through food delivery. Um, and in particular, in, in Cape Town, there has been the development of the Cape Town Together Community Action Network, which has helped to coordinate and, um, and support these types of initiatives. And there's been a lot of learning that has taken place in that space but also a lot of mobilization of resources because the resources provided by the state have really been inadequate. I must also say that it's not just the Western Cape. I'm also aware of similar initiatives taking place in Gauteng with the C19 People's Coalition, for example, and the Gauteng Together Network, which is being uh, driven, I think, to a large extent by the Ahmed Katrada Foundation. So, and I'm sure there are other initiatives around the country in other cities that are, that are taking place. So, Florian, the statistics tell a very interesting story here in that uh, the first month and a half, uh, the South African Social Security Agency reported that the national number of people no longer getting paid anything at all spiraled from 5.2% to 15.4% and worse is expected to come. Do we have an exact understanding of the number of people who go hungry in the country? Um, that is very difficult to say at this stage, and it, and it will keep changing. I think the latest information is probably from the UJ HSRC study that I quoted earlier on. Mm. Uh, they've done uh, three waves of survey already. In the first um, survey, they showed that in the Western Cape, we had 17.5% uh, hungry. In the second wave, it was 21%. And at the, at the national level, we had an increase of 16% to 20%. Um, and th those figures are already a little bit outdated. It's difficult to, to keep track of these things. Things are changing rapidly. But the level of hunger is extreme. And um, this is of great concern from a health perspective um, and also from a human development perspective because it, it will compromise the development of, of children, particularly young children, quite severely.
but also it will exacerbate people's um, susceptibility to COVID. As we know, COVID is um, something that uh, is exacerbated by comorbidities um, mm -hmm. like non-communicable diseases, particularly obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and the like. Um, and like any infectious disease, our immunity to it will depend on adequate nutrition, particularly micronutrients. And as people go hungry, what we do know is that they tend to reduce the quality of their diets and they will fall back on the basic staples, mealy meal, oil, uh, sugar, um, bread, and uh, basically cut out the fresh foods. And, and that in particular has also been affected by the closure of a lot of the street trade, which is, as we can see from our research um, mm. with the School of Public Health recently, that um, it's the street traders who are often the ones that provide affordable and convenient access to the fresh food. And while government has provided uh, business support incentives to formal businesses um, and has, has been very supportive also in, in enabling uh, supermarkets to continue operating, um, there's really been no real support to the informal trade. And just and, to... um, we know that the civil... Uh, um, Sorry, carry My on. apologies, you can carry on. Yes, you can carry on. Yeah, well, we know that the civil society response is already challenged. Um, they are experiencing um, donor fatigue to some extent. Mm -hmm. Also, the funds available from national government are quite limited and are likely to dwindle um, unless massive uh, initiatives are taken to, to put more resources behind that. So, um, you know, the civil society response has been really important in the short term, and we hope that it will also continue to play an, an important role but what really also is required is a, is a much bigger economic stimulus approach. Um, and I think one of the things that should be seriously discussed is this in issue of a universal basic income grant and also particularly business support to the informal sector, both from national government, but then also from provinces and from local government. You touched on a very interesting aspect about uh, donor fatigue. What do you think is causing this? Well, I think most um, donor organizations wouldn't have planned for this um, level of intervention. And I think the, the amount of funding available in a lot of these organizations is obviously limited. And um, I think, you know, previously food insecurity was widespread in our country, but it was quite hidden in a way. No one was really paying attention to it much. Um, but if we look at the latest FAO stats, um, you know, in South Africa, we probably had about 80% of people food insecure by the food insecurity experience scale measure. So there's different measures of, of food insecurity. But what it basically means is that approximately 80% of the country and were basically uncertain and anxious about being able to access enough food. It doesn't mean they were always going hungry, but there was uncertainty. And of those, about 30% were severely food insecure, meaning that they quite often experienced hunger as well. So... It's almost like that's a, a powder keg that we were sitting on. And uh, what we're seeing with lockdown is, is a classical case of, of uh, a shock, a systemic shock, which uh, is now rippling through society. And many of those people who were previously food insecure are now experiencing real hunger. Um, yeah. and, and I don't think that at that scale of things, any of the civil society organizations or donors were ready and, and able to mobilize the, the scale of funding that's required. Uh, please expand on that. Uh, what do you think this pandemic and the ensuing lockdown has taught us about the hunger problem in the country? What are the lessons to be learned? Oh, that's a big question. Well, firstly, that um, food insecurity is very widespread and has been underestimated and hasn't been adequately politicized, in my opinion. Uh, people are ready to go on the streets and toy toy about housing and about, um, you know, service delivery and so forth. But it seems to be fairly um, okay and normal for people to be um, uncertain about food. And, and that is something which is actually just not acceptable um, and, and should be taken much more seriously. The other aspect that we really need to consider in all of this is um, the role of non-communicable diseases. And what I um, spoke about earlier in terms of the um, uh, widespread experience of obesity and, and diabetes and hypertension is um, 
a major issue that also results from food insecurity systemically um, because people are um, economizing and they're basically eating those foods that they can, aff can afford and those are the foods which are making people ill. Uh, and particularly the, um, the reliance on ultra-processed foods, uh, foods that are produced by industry um, using essentially uh, industrial food products. And I'm talking about things like poloni, yep. most of the bread people eat, um, the, the soft drinks, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Sprite, all of those kinds of things. So those are major contributors towards these non-communicable diseases which are making our population so susceptible to, to the COVID pandemic now. Um, so that's one of the things. But more broadly, I think um, we need to think about the, the wider food system. And that is really the, the economic and political system that governs how food moves through society. And in South Africa in particular, our food system is dominated by a handful of really large and powerful corporations, uh, which are, you know, extremely profitable. Mm. And um, so we have these corporations making a lot of money. And at the same time, we have a, a huge population that is, you know, we've got massive unemployment, um, we've got huge poverty, and we're one of the most unequal societies on the planet. Yeah. And uh, while these conditions are ongoing, food insecurity is going to be an endemic issue, and it's going to be a problem that is going to haunt South Africa for generations to come, because we know that um, malnutrition, uh, especially uh, in childhood and, and during um, gestation when the child is in the mother's womb, will have long-term developmental uh, impacts on that child, uh, consequences um, that will make them more likely to develop diabetes and obesity later in life, uh, which will compromise their educational attainment, their, their ability to then um, access uh, gainful employment and so forth. So I think it's an issue that really needs to be considered quite seriously. And um, it is also an issue which uh, will be at the root also of um, uh, you know, societal stability and, and political stability. If we look at um, the Arab Spring, many of the... Um, the kind of um, civil unrest, the, the revolutionary change which happened there was also sparked by experiences of hunger, by food insecurity. And I think that our government hasn't really been paying attention closely enough to this. And I feel also they've been a little bit too shy to, to regulate the corporate sector. And one of the, the key ways of looking at this, which I think should be considered in South Africa, is that the food system really is a commons, which means that it is it is in everyone's interest that this be managed in a transparent way, in a in a democratic way, in a participatory way, and in a way that doesn't allow the extraction of obscene um, profits at the expense of the masses. And um, I think we also need to recall that you know our constitution really uh, makes it very clear that, that people have a right to food. And particularly for children, that is an immediately realizable right. And the state has this responsibility. Mm. And so far, the state at the national level has been understanding that in terms of agriculture and in terms of trade, uh, international trade. And um, at provincial level, also mostly in terms of agriculture. And there's slow change. But for a long time, the local state has not really understood food security to be its mandate. Well, Florian, uh, sorry to cut you short there, but uh, big very insightful input. And yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see how civil society has basically responded to avert what would have possibly been a hunger catastrophe. When Newsfeed PM returns, we follow up on the hostage situation that the SAPS responded to in the early hours of this morning at the International Pentecostal Holiness Church in the west of Johannesburg. We will cross to our reporter, Balita Tani, about